Thank you very much, Tony. Um, I'm on my way home from Japan, actually, and we've just been talking about Trans-Pacific Partnership and uh, what it might offer for New Zealand, and naturally I'm going to have to cover that today. But I would, uh, first of all, just to remind you that, uh, make no mistake about it, while we all might be converts to the primary sector and its potential, we're in a city that needs reminding all the time. And it's only as recently as 2001 that the Knowledge Wave Conference was held here, and most of New Zealand's large agribusiness uh, companies were not invited, including my own. So might I start first of all and uh, with a quote from Jim Collins, uh, to me one of the best uh, business writers that's been in his book Good to Great, but his latest book's called Great by Choice, and his first two sentences are, we cannot predict the future, but we can create it. And you heard this morning from Minister Nathan Guy that it is the government's goal to grow the country's exports from 30 to 40 per cent of GDP, but this is simply not remotely possible without significantly lifting the productive base and earnings of the primary industries, including agriculture and natural resources. Let's consider Auckland, since we're here. And these are quotes of, um, from Len Brown's speech to a conference that I was at last year. 36.7% of New Zealand's GDP is generated here. 50% of foreign direct investment, and hell, they seem to have a lot of say about that. One third of the country's employment, one third of the country's businesses, but only 7% of our merchandised exports come from Auckland. And consider IT. Tyler Cowan, a pretty well-known American economist in a very good little book called The Great Stagnation, reminds us that most web, in web activities do not generate jobs and revenue at the rate of past technological breakthroughs. And even some of the world's biggest uh, uh, IT companies are actually quite low employers. So what I'm going to say is we do know more trade equals more growth, and hence that's the subject that I want to talk about. I'll focus first of all on changing Asia, China, and the Trans-Pacific Partnership and responses to that. Now what has actually changed in terms of agriculture is the uh, combination of the cost of subsidies and rising international food prices have meant, with the yellow line, that the level of support in OECD countries to agriculture has dropped from just under 30, just under 40 per cent to now under 20 per cent. This is generating change, and yet some of our largest markets, like Japan, are still caught in a time warp. And not far from here, we have the biggest mass migration in human history. Every day, 144,000, this is according to McDonald's Corporation data, people are moving from the country into the cities. And we're creating every week a new Auckland in Asia. For McDonald's Corporation, and we do all of their burgers in New Zealand, make them, and for the Pacific Islands, and we're a part of the Asia-Pacific uh, Middle East region, the threshold in terms of determining where to put new restaurants is 5,000 US dollars per capita income. And there's no question that if you're looking at Asia, we're looking at nearly threefold increase across the region between 2010 and 2020, hence big opportunities for protein. And we're actually seeing this happening at the moment. The light blue line here uh, represents the growth in dairy. But I'm pleased, uh, since uh, Andrew Talley's there and, and investing in the meat industry, the dark blue line, Andrew, is the meat side of it. So hence, the opportunities are there for us. And there is, in fact, a very strong correlation be between GDP, growth, protein, and grain. And this is a well-known uh, piece of analysis uh, done in regard to uh, the movement in poultry consumption. Could be applied to other proteins. What we are seeing globally is a massive shift. The shift in the global economy is away from the United States and the EU towards Asia, with the big mover, of course, being China. The OECD has compiled a set of projections through to 2060, and the dark blue line uh, on this, uh, this graph shows the 2011 position, 
with 2030 in, in uh, brown or red, and 2060, obviously, uh, the position out 50 years. The movers are the non-OECD or emerging economies. Obviously, the OECD is going down, and within that, within the next 20 years, clearly China is a key mover. What we do know is that China's uh, growth is still continuing at a substantial rate. Some will say, well, China's in decline. Last year, I remind you, it was still 7.8% growth. This year, the projections are 7.5%. The important thing is China remains on target to double its GDP in 20, by 2020 compared with 2010. And it's also interesting to note that China last year for the first time overtook the United States as the world's largest merchandise trader. Now New Zealand is responding to this already because clearly uh, we are seeing a massive shift in trade to China. It has grown from around $2 billion to $7 billion a year in the space of just five years during a global recession. Australia is also growing but alongside that, we're seeing stagnation or decline in our other key markets. And I know already China is, is the New Zealand seafood industry's biggest market, but reality is it is going to grow. And from humble beginnings back in 2000, only 3% of our exports were going to China. Last year, it reached 15%. So China is New Zealand's hottest export market, and it certainly eased the pain in terms of what has gone on with the global financial crisis. It is responsible for over half of New Zealand's additional exports in the past five years. And our trade is also becoming more balanced. You'll see on the blue line on the, uh, and the pink line, the pink line is actually uh, New Zealand imports from China, the blue line's New Zealand exports. And by the end of this year, it is likely that China's origin product, exports to China will actually exceed our, uh, China origin imports. So a massive shift is occurring. And yes, there's been growth in seven product areas. Obviously, dairy in blue at the bottom is the big mover. Alongside that, wood and wood products. But I can say to you that I think the next big mover is going to be meat. We do have a free trade agreement negotiated in 2008, and by 2016, most of the, uh, our products exported to China, key products exported to China, will be duty-free. Our leaders in 2010, that is both Prime Minister Key and the uh, Chinese president, actually said, we aim to double exports within five years, 2015. Well, I believe it'll happen within four years. So. A huge change is occurring. And China itself, already last year, was dependent on imports for 21.2% of its total food needs. Also interesting, last year, corn production for the first time exceeded rice, corn used to feed animals. And human grain consumption is actually reduced to 60% of its 1990 levels. The big mover has been milk. If we compare milk demand in China, today it is threefold compared with 1990 and is forecast now to double between now and 2020. To put it in some number terms, current demand for milk in China is about 35 billion litres a year to grow to 70 billion litres. New Zealand's total production of milk at the moment is 17 billion litres. There's no hope in hell of New Zealand being able to supply uh, the increased demand out of China. I'll move on with the next slide, which actually talks about modernisation process, but clearly where China is moving from what was been a peasant economy to an economy now uh, with new genetics, vaccines, and clearly imported, uh, those imported genetics will increase the production base. But it is a long time out, in my view. So, enough of China. Now let's move to the Trans-Pacific Partnership negotiations because the huge move with those has been the introduction of Japan. Yes, the New Zealand government was promoting the idea that
that we're in for a 21st century agreement and the United States was going to be kind and negotiate with all the little players that all made up the, tw made up the then 11 members of the TPP negotiations. But make no mistake, the farm lobby in the United States is now swayed and very much behind TPP because Japan's there. The goal, opportunities have increased enormously. With the inclusion of Japan, TPP covers 38% of the world's uh, uh, GDP and 23% of the world's exports. So clearly with this, Japan being included, the United States uh, sees this as a game a changer and uh, is determined, I think, to make something of it. But I believe that Japan will not be the problem, it'll be the United States still to get across the line. And that may sound rather um, optimistic compared with the protectionist policies that Japan have applied in the past when it's come to agriculture. But this graph, based on some very sophisticated econometric analysis done in the United States by the by the International, by the Institute, Peterson Institute of International Economics and East West Centre, shows that Japan's GDP, through a comprehensive GDP, uh, through a comprehensive Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership Agreement, uh, can grow two percent a year, about the same as New Zealand. So, a comprehensive TPP is a game changer. And if I just put those in New Zealand context with with Japan, we expect uh, export growth to be of the order of $5.1 billion by 2025. Again, it comes back to being comprehensive, but this is based on 2007 real dollar t in real dollar terms. And what other opportunities do we have out there, along with China, that can change this? Obviously, there are other FTAs also being uh, negotiated as well. The Taiwanese one is already complete and will start in 2014. I won't dwell any further. And Jeff Taylor uh, earlier today told you what, of the shift that is already occurring in the New Zealand pastoral scene with the move uh, to, to dairying and away from sheep production in particular. This is happening on our shores and pastoral land is also uh, converting away from sheep and cattle use into dairying. One food group, and I see Kevin Marshall's here from the Riddit Institute, reckoned that uh, New Zealand's export earnings could increase to $60 billion. Uh, in fact, the government has seized upon this and made it $64 billion, as you heard this morning from Nathan Guy. They see it as dependent on R&D resourcing and, and expect it to deliver 50% of the government's 2025 goals, equaling 40%. My personal view is that R&D is only a part of the enabling process. The greatest influences will be unleashing the country's best potential economic multiplier, water. Improve market access, especially for value-added foods and related products, because we do have a huge number of issues behind the border. And clearly, to take up this opportunity, we are going to have to have access to capital and the nurturing of a number of entrepreneurs with the energy and ambition to move beyond the beach and the batch to $100 million plus businesses linked internationally. Back in 2009, I chaired the New Zealand International Business Forum. We came up with things that are necessary for the government to move on. I'm pleased to say they didn't pick them up much in the last term, but they are getting on with it now. What are the business imper imperatives if we are to get there? Well, I put it at the top of the list, integrity of New Zealand's biosecurity and animal production systems because we're about supplying safe foods, improved market access, adding value, not cost. And this is one thing we have to remind farmers sometimes, that those of us in business servicing the industry have to earn enough profits to actually reinvest in innovation and product development. I just want to concentrate for a little moment on value add because it seems to slip off the tongues easily of commentators and politicians who are always pointing out the great value-adding opportunities. This is much more difficult than imagined. And I just want to say here are, are four different companies that we have set up uh, and the learnings of those. Uh, um, 
Commercialization period has always exceeded the initial objectives. I know scientists are pretty good at telling us the opportunities, but even when we set these conservatively, we always exceed them. We do have raw material variability. Uh, some of the biggest variabilities we have in New Zealand are pH levels. So consistency is a problem. Our greatest success has always come through existing customer or, uh, existing or potential customer relationships. And one thing we have learned is it's highly risky to rely on one customer and one market. So execution of the available science also has been very difficult in a commercial environment. And personally, I love PGP uh, because it does mean that with both parties having something on the line, uh, we're going to get the best outcomes. So earlier this year, I was asked to speak to the Ministry of Primary Industry along with Graham Stewart, and I just summarise what I actually said. We've got to continue to promote the importance and future potential of the primary industries to the New Zealand economy. Drive everyone nuts. We've got to produce authoritative public reports on key issues, such as water potential, foreign investment. Biosecurity is integral to the protection of the New Zealand brand. We need to ensure implementation of the world's best practice procedures. We need to increase resources available for market access improvement especially to enhance value-added prospects. We need to recognise that the Primary Growth Partnership is a journey requiring implementation, flexibility and commercial timelines because any process of discovery uh, has its ups and downs and cul-de-sacs. We need to open informed public debate on biotechnology, both the pros and the cons of it. And within government, I happen to sit on the Lincoln University Council and I can tell you it's no fun trying to get extra funds from the government, even for agricultural education. We need to ensure a greater share of education and science resources are devoted to skills training and R&D related, prim uh, related to the primary industries. Now, despite all these opportunities, we do have the naysayers, and there's one who's prominently in this town, and obviously, uh, you've heard others, they were, they were out there uh, when we had the recent food safety scare with Fonterra, um, but the reality is, what are we better at in New Zealand? And we do have our, our hurdles. Tom Scott summed this up 25 years ago in this cartoon. Inflation, probably the hurdles got a little lower, the interest rates have also gone down and the exchange rate hurdle has gone up, but it's still very valid today. Now, I come from New Zealand's most highly competitive industry, the meat industry. Look, it's a cutthroat business in more than one way. We don't know about collaboration, some would say, in our industry. This cartoon back in 1994 said that we don't see, we don't hear, we don't speak. And that may be true of some of our competitors. But the reality is, if we are to get on and innovate, We've got to join hands. We've got to collaborate. And even in New Zealand, across sectors, the International Business Forum is one where uh, a, a number of like-minded organisations, we get behind, let's say, the bike shed. We actually try to work on things to improve New Zealand's international competitiveness. We try to work with the government on trade access and gen agenda and we do it in a non-threatening way, an inclusive way, and make no mistake about it in dealing with Asia because uh, we operate in a, in a part of the world with opaque regulations, changing regulations, there is no other way to do it. You can't do it in the media. And I happen to be also, something's gone wrong, closely associated with an, a true global links in the seafood industry uh, in Sea Lloyd, I actually represent Nisui, uh, and uh, here we are investing in New Zealand. Nisui also owns 25% of Ansco Foods as well, a long relationship that actually started back in 1984, selling uh, mutton from our uh, processing operations in Korea that went into canned uh, mutton to replace um, whale meat at the time. But this is a good, op good example of international collaboration and one that uh, brings 
benefits, I believe, to Sea Lord. On a specific level, I just want to give you some examples of what we've done in ANSCO. At a technology transfer level, we operate New Zealand's only large-scale cattle feedlot in mid-Canterbury called Five Star Beef. At the time we, we established that feedlot, there was actually only one small paddock of maize grown in mid-Canterbury. So clearly we got together with the seed company, we got a consultancy firm and farmer suppliers, and we've operated a producer club since 1991. We've almost doubled the uh, dry matter per hectare yield, and obviously uh, the beneficiaries have become dairy farmers, not us, unfortunately, but uh, without it, we certainly could not have uh, run a feedlot in mid-Canterbury. In the manufactured foods area, we also have an ANSCO, a major food company in Japan, Ito Ham, who's uh, been prepared to help us with product development, but we've also learnt a huge amount from our Japanese customers, and that product development has enabled us to supply markets elsewhere in the world, because there's no more discerning market when it comes to food than Japan. And we had product problems in producing manufactured products with foreign objects. So we went to the Institute of Geological and Nuclear Science and they were trying to deal with foreign objects and wool. And we said, how about applying that to meat products? And so the transfer occurred and we got together with Smiths, one of the world's two major manufacturers of dual X-ray technology. And between us, we have a full traceability and object and uh, detection system and we uh, jointly own the IP around the world. We've also got together on high frequency uh, uh, radio, identif uh, radio identification for supply chain management. And uh, the head of ANSCO's IT uh, department, in fact, chairs this group here in New Zealand. We are working with the, with the supermarkets, etc., of the world on this technology. In terms of marketplace collaboration, well, Here's an example, New Zealand Lamb Company in North America. We're actually competing with that. We're actually uh, collaborating with our competition, especially in the South Island in Alliance and Silver Fern Farms. Even though ANSCO has its own beef office in Chicago, handling uh, the whole North American region, we think it's best to be together in this alliance for lamb. And in the United Kingdom, Waitrose. Waitrose overtrades in terms of lamb and uh, fish three to four times its supermarket share and we have a partnership with Welsh lamb producers who supply waitress for about half the year, best in season, and we do it for the other half exclusively and that collaboration also involves Sea Lord because Sea Lord supplies most of Waitrose fish, largely sourced of course from Iceland and elsewhere in the Northern Hemisphere. And in China, lastly, to be frank, we don't know what, how it's going to turn out in China in terms of our future strategy. So we're, we've got a number of shops out there, McDonald's, Mitsubishi Corporation, Itoham, UNIQ, who have a joint venture with Kofco in terms of pork and chicken. And we're also working with the New Zealand Primary Sector Partnership, which involves Sea Lord about uh, how we might gather information. And clearly we've got other channels as well, but all of these are examples of how do we attack a market? Let's fire a few shots before we de determine what cannonball we'll fire, which takes me back to the beginning and Jim Collins, and I commend you to read his book. Thank you very much for listening to me, and uh, good luck.